Hey folks, Ryan here, and I'm back with the next episode of the Project Keg Rocket video series. That last video got way more attention than I thought it would, and I cannot be more thrilled by how positive the reception was, so thank you, and message received. I'm gonna try and keep putting out these videos as best I can. In that last episode, we established that we're here to build a big 13 foot long liquid bipropellant rocket that uses two actual beer kegs as its fuel and oxidizer tanks. We set off on a fact finding mission to find out if these beer kegs could handle a little bit of extra pressure, which we need to make the rocket work. Spoiler alert. Seems like they can. But it probably doesn't come as a surprise to you that it's not gonna be that simple. We can't just hop online, buy a liquid rocket engine at the liquid rocket engine web store, slap it on a couple of beer kegs and have that work in any safe or effective manner. No, we've got some real life engineering challenges to deal with. And a big part of what I think is intriguing about this project is that despite its pretty absurd premise, it's actually gonna require a lot of neat creativity, design, engineering, etc., to make this all work. So with that out of the way, I think it's best to dedicate an episode talking about our high level keg based propulsion system and how that's supposed to work to really set the technical context and background for why things are the way they are from this point onwards. Now let's start with the propellant combination. Just to set the stage here, Keg Rocket has like no real engineering requirements. It just has to fly and as long as we can get off the launch rail and have fun doing it, it's mission accomplished as far as I'm concerned. But in order to start a detailed design of the rocket, we're gonna have to start with some basic parameters. And probably the most basic parameter for any liquid fuel rocket is the propellant combination or what combination of fuel and oxidizer the rocket will burn to make thrust. Practically, there are a lot more fuels than oxidizers to choose from, so let's start there. First, I knew we wanted to choose a fuel that's inexpensive, easy to obtain, and relatively safe to work with. That basically leaves us with a couple of alcohols and most day-to-day -day hydrocarbons. But since this project is kind of a big engineering meme, how cool and funny would it be if the rocket could burn ethanol, which is really just a super concentrated version of the alcohol that normally comes in beer kegs, to make this thing fly? That would be perfect, and one of my favorite things about this project is that I can just say, yep, that's hilarious, and boom, we'll make it work. That's what we're going with. So now it's time to choose an oxidizer, and for us, there's really only two practical options here, being nitrous oxide and liquid oxygen. As it happens, my buddy Paulo, who's very smart, pointed out to me that liquid oxygen is actually a neat oxidizer to ethanol because at a mass mixture ratio of about 1.45, not only is it decently high performance, but it actually uses equal volumes of fuel and oxidizer. So let's look at that a little bit deeper. Here I have a container full of actual ethanol, and here I have a special solution that I've mixed up to be the exact same density as liquid oxygen at 1.14 kilograms per liter. Let's go ahead and measure out any mass of ethanol into this cup. In this case, I have arbitrarily measured out about 200 grams of ethanol. To mimic Keg Rocket's mixture ratio of 1.45, let's grab our fake liquid oxygen and measure out 1.45 times that 200 grams of fuel to yield a corresponding 290 grams of liquid oxygen. If we wanted to run our rocket engine, this would be our specified mixture ratio of propellants to feed it. The actual amount per second would be different, but the overall mass ratio remains the same. When I pour the ethanol and fake liquid oxygen into identical containers though, something pretty neat becomes apparent. Even though there are physically different amounts of the propellants here, they actually take up the same amount of volume, which is uh, pretty useful when your rocket's tanks are made out of two identical beer kegs. Not only that, but it's slightly fuel rich to help the engine run a little cooler. So here we have imbalanced mass flow rates, which is desirable, but we also have equivalent volumetric flow rates, which is perfect for keg rocket. The Federal Aviation Administration, or FAA, here in the United States has a few different rocket classifications, and they depend mainly on the rocket's total impulse, which is basically a single numerical parameter that describes some combination of thrust and burn time. 
Most simply, this can be found by multiplying the rocket's average thrust by its burn time. For instance, a rocket that makes 1,000 pounds of thrust for, let's say, 9.2 seconds would have a total impulse of 9,200 pound seconds. If you happen to have a rocket made of beer kegs that made about 825 pounds of thrust for 11 seconds, that would also be worth about 9,200 pound seconds. So what's up with this oddly specific 9,200 pound second number? Well, that's pretty darn close to the FAA class two impulse limit of 9,208 pound seconds. And due to that, I have pretty much arbitrarily set keg rockets total impulse limit at 9,200 pound seconds. Any more than this and keg rocket gets classified as a class three rocket, which is fine, but it requires some extra analysis and paperwork that I don't wanna to have to deal with just yet. This pretty much means that keg rocket packs as much energy as the largest solid O motor, which is plenty enough for a good time if you ask me, and turns out there's still plenty of room to grow. As you might expect, a rocket's total impulse is strongly correlated with the amount of propellant that it physically contains. And if you math that out for keg rocket, it turns out to be about 10 liters of ethanol and 10 liters of liquid oxygen. Since we're using two 30 liter kegs here, you'll notice that's actually only about one third of the total tank volume, leaving two thirds of each keg totally empty. That might seem like a lot of wasted space, but I realize we can be resourceful and use that empty space for something useful. Any liquid rocket engine combustion chamber needs a higher pressure going into it than exists in the combustion chamber itself to drive the propellant flow in the right direction. To minimize cost and complexity, we can implement a pressure-fed propellant feed system operating in blowdown mode, which in our case is the simplest way to accomplish this. And wouldn't you know it, this type of propellant feed system actually loves having a bunch of extra space in the tanks to make it work best. All right, so to explain why having a little bit of extra empty space in our tanks can actually be useful to us, I've created a quick little demonstration out of some fittings I had laying around and a two liter soda bottle. So how this works is we've got a two liter soda bottle here, which we'll pretend is like our beer keg and we'll fill it to varying levels of our fake propellant here. Up at the top, we've got a pressure gauge, which lets us know what the pressure in there is at any given time, as well as a check valve, which lets gas flow in, but not out. So if I were to pressurize it with a compressed air source right here, when I remove it, the whole thing would stay pressurized. First, let's fill the bottle up almost all the way to the top, leaving just a little bit of space for some air. I'll pressurize it up to about 50 PSI, and when I open the main propellant valve, water shoots into our rocket engine bucket, just like we'd expect. However, the pressure in the bottle plummets and the flow slows to just a trickle after a few seconds. Now that I've got the bottle filled up to about one third full, just like it would be on keg rocket, I'll pressurize the thing up to about the same pressure and let it flow again. You can see that the flow is much more strong and stable, and there's even some pressure left over after all the propellant is fed into the bucket. So here we can see that with our isolated propellant feed system, more gas space means that we get a more stable feed pressure and flow rate going out to our rocket engine. This is a type of pressure feed system specifically configured to operate in what's called blowdown mode. It's classified as blowdown because there's a constant number of gas molecules in each tank that lose pressure, or blow down, as it expands out to feed the engine at the pressure and flow rate that it needs. But if you want a stable flow rate, why not just continuously feed the tank with pressure like this? Well, we could put a separate tank somewhere on board the rocket, which continuously pressurizes the tanks in flight. Plenty of rockets do this, but for our rocket, that's a whole bunch more complexity, weight, and number of failure points to deal with that really isn't value added based on the level of performance that we need. Really, the only extra complication is that we'll have to design our rocket engine to handle the decaying feed pressure. So by using all this extra space in our tanks that's just going to exist anyways based on our total impulse limit, we can build a rocket that's ultimately simpler, more reliable, and less expensive. 
Unlike the rocket you just saw, Keg Rocket relies purely on aerodynamics to fly straight. In order for these big ol' fins to do anything, it has to be traveling at pretty decent speed when it comes off the launch rail. In order to achieve this, we're targeting a liftoff thrust to weight ratio of at least four, which will ensure that the rocket has enough velocity to be passively stable when it leaves the launch rail. Based on our current mass estimates, that means the rocket will need to produce about 1,000 pounds of thrust at liftoff, which will decay to about 650 pounds of thrust throughout its burn before it burns out and coasts to apogee. So now hopefully you can see how this bigger picture is actually meshing together pretty nicely for our beer keg based propulsion system. And I'm super excited to document the process on how we're turning this higher level system design into actual nitty gritty rocket parts. Bear with me though, because keg rocket is totally a passion project. It's my hobby, but I have to balance it with all sorts of things like life and work and whatnot. Rest assured, Keg Rocket is happening. It's just a long-term project, and hopefully you're as excited for the journey as I am. If you're enthusiastically watching this video, you are helping out the project, and I really appreciate it. Also, thanks to Amygda Launch and our friends in the description for really helping to make this project happen. So that's all for this episode. In the next one, I think we might talk a little bit about how this airframe has gone together, but uh, we'll see. Anyways, I'm Ryan Callahan. This is Project Keg Rocket. And thanks for watching. A class two limb pulse limit. Limb pulse limit. Oh. So.